Welcome back. Uh, we're going to join the start. Uh, let's have a word of prayer and then we'll come back. So Lord, we come uh, back to your word tonight and we want to be better at reading it, understanding it. Uh, so we pray, Father, you'll uh, open our eyes to hear whatever lessons that you may have for us tonight. Uh, we give you thanks for this uh, and we invite you to be around our tables. In the name of Christ tonight, we would pray. Amen. Okay, so this is the last of our five uh, sessions study uh, on how to become a better and more competent Bible reader. Um, if you've missed some or whatever, I'll just remind you that they're, that they're on the website. Uh, you go under the media tab and then under the sermon series and you'll find pastor study on, on, the, on Bible reading for beginners and everybody else. Um, so what we said last time is that oftentimes we get the feeling that, that we miss in something because we're, when we're engaged with the biblical witness, uh, we don't really know the full context of what's being written there. Uh, so to get at that, we, we have to make an effort to understand uh, a few things. The, uh, the uh, historical, uh, let's see, where did that go? Okay, yeah. The historical uh, context and the cultural context uh, and the geographical context. Um, with respect to the historical, for instance, that involves uh, the sort of geopolitics of the time and even the sort of events in geology that happened before any of us were, were ever here. Uh, we mentioned as an example, there's, a, uh, there's an earthquake uh, that is cited in Amos 1. Um, then later on, it's remembered by actually Zechariah, who writes 150 years later, uh, and a massive event that is apparently felt throughout the entire region. And we know that such an earthquake happened in about 750 BC, registering uh, up to eight and a half on, on the Richter scale, destroying almost everything, uh, all the way from Damascus, Syria, down through that Rift Valley uh, and the Jordan, uh, uh, all that river area, uh, down almost out of the Dead Sea. Um, now, we said that, that it was Josephus, who was the Jewish historian, remember he's the guy that starts off on the Jewish side in the Jewish, Jewish uh, wars against the Romans, figures out, hmm, the Romans are winning, I'm going to change sides, and it goes over on the Romans, and then he becomes their sort of Jewish guide to everything happening for them. And, jo and Josephus um, um, seems to suggest that it was the umbrage of Uzziah, uh, King Uzziah that, that actually preceded that, that massive quake when, when in his words uh, a rent was made in the temple the bright rays of the sun shone through it and fell upon the king's face and he got leprosy and before the city at the place called Eroge half the mountain broke off from the rest on the west uh, and we know that that's also what actually happens according to the archaeological record uh, but we also mentioned the sort of striking that story of Cyrus the Great He's the Persian uh, who allowed the Jewish exiles who had been hauled off to Babylon by the Babylonian Empire. Uh, when he conquers Babylon, he, has, he, he, he lets them all go home. Uh, but again, one of the reasons why he does that, which you won't get in the scriptures, but you can get from extra biblical sources, uh, and it, it is because Josephus tells us uh, that Daniel, one of the guys that had been hauled out of, out of Israel and put into the court, uh, shows him a copy of Isaiah, of the prophecy of Isaiah, which was written 150 years earlier, in which Cyrus is identified by name. Um, this is the Lord to his anointed to Cyrus. You know, well, that's just weird. Um, but it sort of gives you some, uh, some, some suggestion that there's, there's something more going on here in this story. We alluded as well to the bad story of why good King Josiah dies so young. Uh, and, and it is um, uh, because of something that he does, which has some geopolitics involved in it. Uh, and why Pilate, in the time of Jesus, uh, allowed himself to be so manipulated by those, those, those Jewish leaders. Um, so we identified culture... Uh, as the social customs that sort of guide the way uh, in which, in which uh, um, stories uh, unfold. Um, uh, and we'll look at just a little, a little more at this culture of uh, marriage uh, in the time of Mary and, and of Joseph. 
Uh, and why it is that though they were, they were still not married, in what the sense of all, all, all of us might say, uh, Joseph still has to decide whether or not he will legally divorce Mary when she becomes pregnant with, with this son from, from God, Jesus. Now, in all of this, what we see is a rather cardinal principle, as our um, friend Jack Beck has phrased it. The Bible was written for us, it was not written to us. Okay? So, we're in fact reading something which may not fit our exact um, backgrounds. Uh, that brings us a little more to say about sort of geographical history. We didn't really get into that last week. That involves both the sort of uh, physical geography and human geography and also natural history. Um, natural features and forces of the land on which the story plays out and the role of plants and animals and insects and uh, all that and the human use and the impact on the land uh, that we see in response. Uh, where things happen sometimes determine why they happened as they did. Okay? Um, now, the problem is, it is incredibly easy to get lost and get, uh, and, get, and get confused. And sometimes the directions people give us don't really help all that much. Uh, one of our appointments up in East Texas was trying to find a, a member's house that lived out in the country. In East Texas, everybody lives out in the country. Um, and someone said, uh, to find their house, I should go to where the red barn used to be and turn left. <laughs> that's kind of directions I like. Okay, that's really helpful. <laughs> Another person gave me similar directions. He said, go to where you see a herd of cows and then turn right. Uh, you, you can't miss it, he said. Uh, and I did. Um, Sometimes when the Bible authors mention geography, it's just about as nonsensical to our ears as that. Uh, Jack, Jack Beck gives us, uh, for example, the story of David and Goliath. Everybody knows that story, right? Everybody knows David. Do you remember how the story starts? Well, you, you probably don't because you probably skimmed right over it, okay? Because it made no sense to you. Uh, that story starts with, now the Philistines gathered their forces for war and assembled at Soko in Judah. They pitched camp at Ephes Damin between Soko and Azekah. And Saul and the Israelites assembled and camped in the valley of Elah. Okay, so we're clear now, right? Um, exactly where this is. Um, <coughs> geography really is all throughout the pages of the Bible. Uh, that's so because the Bible is filled with stories about real people who lived in real times, in real places. Um, um, more significantly, the geography is there because God often intimately links the message of the Bible to a particular place of the promised land, for instance. Um, geography has the ability to likewise influence our perceptions and responses. Think for an instance about the well-known phrase to all of us, at least here, Remember the Alamo, okay? <coughs> Where was that cry first made? Anybody know? Where was that first shouted out? <coughs> Gonzales. Gonzales. And then at the Battle of San Jacinto, uh, uh, not all that far from here, 1836. And why did they say it? <coughs> why did they cry that out? People died in the Alamo. David Crockett died in the Alamo. Um, the uh, leader for the Mexicans had everyone that survived put to the sword. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it was a brutal time. Uh, <coughs> so, what's the point of saying, remember the Alamo, though? It is to remind the Texians, as, as we used to be called, of what happened so far and encourage them in their fight for independence. It's like, you ought to remember what happened to, to our friends, our relatives, our family, our people at the Alamo, and that ought to motivate you, shouldn't it? Um, the Alamo is not just a place name, then. it's a place name linked to a highly charged and emotional event. Uh, and in that sense, places are not just locations on the map sometimes. Rather, they, 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 they sort of carry those connotations that the biblical authors use to influence the perception of their readers. Um, now, sometimes that involves poetry, um, and for a lot of us, that's where we, we kind of lose it. I mean, yeah. okay. 
Um, but Psalm 125, 2, for instance, says that uh, as the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people from this time forth and, 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 and forevermore. <coughs> we'll come back to that in a few minutes. Um, but what should be clear to us, even if some of the place names or the, or, or the directions are not clear to us, is that geography is more often than not a vital part of the story. Um, and so if we want to become competent Bible readers, we need to learn as much as we can about, about those sort of geographical items, the geology, the topography, <coughs> the water, the climate, land usage, etc. So a helpful place to start is with the Bible Atlas, and I'll give you an idea for that one um, in a few minutes too. Let's go back then to David and Goliath. Um, it would take a, a, a little work to, do, to sort of decode these geographical details uh, that, that we find in the story there, uh, 1 Samuel 17. But when we do that, our understanding of geography really does change how we read this, this, uh, this whole story. Now the places all mentioned, um, uh, Soko, Azeka, Ephesdam, all have a connection. They're all in the valley of, of Elah, uh, where we're told that this lights camp. Uh, so, um, the Joneses have been with us uh, when we've been in the Valley of Elah, uh, and we sort of looked at that, and, and you've, you stood across, we stood up at, up at Soko, and we could see uh, where, where, where the, the battle would have happened. It's not a very big valley. When we say valley, this is not uh, Barbara Stanwyck, how big was my green was my valley kind of thing. This, this, this is just a smaller one. Um, that tells us what we're really talking about here is national security. Um, the Philistines lived um, mainly on the plain, uh, not in Spain, but there was rain, okay? Um, uh, and that rain produced a more agriculturally rich and open coastal growing land. Uh, the Israelites, by contrast, lived uh, principally along the mountain spine that runs north and south through the heart of Israel. That is a hilly terrain that is harder to farm. Uh, if you're going to farm, it has to be terrace farming, just every few feet down. You have to build a terrace, you have to go, go uh, do that. Um, it's not a good farm area, but it offers a whole lot more of security. Um, now, between those, those two areas, and what's kind of this, this light, the lighter color, is the Shephelah. Um, that's the Hebrew term for humble hills. Um, uh, it really is just kind of modern, modern sized hills. These hills are punctuated by wide valleys that run east to west, perpendicular to the mountains. Uh, and what that does is provide a natural travel corridor from the coastal plain uh, into the mountainous uh, parts uh, uh, that are further in. So, um, to enjoy the highest level of national security, what do the Israelites need to do? If you live in the section on the right, the Philistines live in the section on the left, and there's a section in between you that's a buffer zone, what's your best strategy for your security? Defend the allies. Yeah. Control the buffer zone. Yeah, I mean, really. Because uh, you don't want them coming. You don't want them coming here. You want them stopping here, okay? Um, and, and so, uh, in that Shephelah, um, any, any time a story happens there, it's really about national security for the Hebrews. Um, uh, King Saul, um, uh, what all this means is that camped at, at, uh, at, at Ephes Deme, uh, uh, which is between uh, the the um, uh, Soko and Azeka, uh, the Philistines have not just entered into the Elah Valley, uh, they have now penetrated it and they nearly control the entire extent of it. Okay? Um, King Saul and his soldiers, in fact, are barely clinging onto the far eastern section of this, of this valley. Um, and all that's pretty much on Saul as the king. Um, he is supposed to lead his people forward. Uh, he is supposed to fight their battles. This is what, what a king is supposed to, 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 supposed to do. Um, he, he is supposed to preserve not just the nation of Israel, but uh, the nation of Israel 
as the incubator uh, for where the Messiah is going to one day be born. Okay? Uh, and the whole plan of God for this, this plan of redemption, God's whole sacred rescue missions, uh, is, is in fact happening. Uh, Deuteronomy 17 speaks to that. Um, now, Saul, as a king, had pretty much failed. Um, he was not protecting his people, uh, and he was not protecting the mission of his people. Um, uh, and Which is why we read in the previous chapter um, that Samuel had anointed David as the new king who would succeed Saul. Um, so what do we have going on here? It is a lot more than the familiar old VBS story about a young kid who had a slingshot and a bully named Goliath. Okay, um, there's there's tension in the in the whole uh, question of the politics of it. Uh, Saul, as the sitting king, has been for reasons of his own making rejected by God. Um, uh, you will no longer be be king. David, as the new king, has not yet been publicly recognized, or he hasn't even been sworn into the office. So the question of who's going to lead God's people is hovering over this whole story, isn't it? Um, but the geographical information given in the first few verses, those ones that you skip over, tells us Israel is confronting a national emergency, full-blown um, so if there's a time for faith, if there's a time for courage, if there's a time for good leadership, it's surely now, right? Um, the Eli Valley is more than just a detail of this story. It's the driving force in it, really. Um, and if this story <coughs> takes place on the coastal plains where the Philistines are, it's a whole different story. If it takes place in the interior, where the, where the Israelites live, uh, Hebron, uh, Bethlehem, uh, it's a whole different story. Um, uh, but it's taking place where it's, it, it's going to make a difference one way or the other. Um, or we can take those, those mountains that the psalmist said surround Jerusalem. Um, when you've been to Israel, what, what you understand is that you always go up to, to Jerusalem. It's uphill. Uh, wherever you come from. Okay. In fact, it's uphill both ways. I don't understand that, but, 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 but it is somehow. Um, it's, it's just not an easy place. Um, and back up a few verses in the, uh, Psalm 125, you read that, that those who trust in the Lord are as Mount Zion, which can't be moved but remains forever. Uh, now, now, where is Mount Zion? Uh, well... It's not where anybody thinks it is necessarily. Uh, it's it's in Jerusalem. It's it's another name for Jerusalem, really. Um, there 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 is a mount a mountain, and I use that word not like Matterhorn. I mean more like you know something smaller uh, that 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 is there that has been identified as Mount Zion, um, but it's probably not the uh, accurate place. But but it's it's there somewhere. Um, <coughs> So, like Mount Zion, which can't be moved but remains forever. And that is a lovely poetic phrase, isn't it? Uh, but it's also a compelling picture of the geography of David's capital. Um, see, Jerusalem, at first glance, doesn't really have much going for it as a capital city. It has a meager water supply. Uh, what does that mean? That means you are limited in your population. Uh, you, you, you can't grow beyond what the water supply can, can, can actually serve. Uh, and it's subject to being cut off, which is the whole reason uh, when, when you go back in the story of good King Hezekiah, he builds a tunnel underground to connect the springs to bring the water into the city. So when the city's being besieged, there's still water coming in. Okay? And you can still walk in the tunnel. Um, you guys been to the tunnel? Yes. Yeah. That's what I was yeah. Okay. I mean, it, it, it's a wonderful thing. Have, have you been in it, Reed? Have you walked in that tunnel? That's, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's wonderful. It's it's this wide and it's this high, uh, and, it, and the water's up here, and you you slow up the, and it is completely dark. It is one third of a mile and completely dark inside, like like this. Okay, um, it's great fun, um, but it, it it is it is part of the story of the of the water issues there. There's not, as we said, there's not much level growing ground. 
so you can't raise a lot of food around it, okay? Uh, in those narrow valleys that sort of surround it, and one of them actually bisects uh, the city. And it is pretty far away from the major transportation routes. Um, if you look at those, uh, the, uh, uh, the one uh, on the right, uh, coming down from Damascus, it's going to come down around, uh, around the Sea of Galilee, and, and come down on the other side of the Jordan River, uh, that's called the Pompatines Highway, uh, and it's it's a pretty well-known trade route. There's another one that comes down and follows this down a purple route called the International Highway. Uh, now, it, let me just say that these are terms which have been developed. Okay, uh, if you had lived there 2,000 years ago, you would not see signs saying International Highway. Okay, uh, but but that that's the trade route uh, that in fact people took. So. This main road here, this main road here, where's Jerusalem? It's between them, okay? Uh, it's not on any main road, okay? Uh, which means uh, that once again, you'll be dependent upon those valleys to go east-west, because this is all mountains coming down, uh, and you don't want to have to do that, uh, so you find some valley and you, and you, and you move through to it. Um, so, if you're not on the main trade route, then you can't make money off a trade, right? Because uh, because no one's going to stop and 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 pay you a tariff for it. Uh, um, so um, Jerusalem really is not a great choice for for capital, is it? Um, but it has one thing going for it, and that is its security, um, because it is buried deep in the central mountains uh, of the country, miles from the flat and accessible coastal plain that runs north and south on the west, and even the relatively more accessible Jordan River Valley that sort of runs on the east. So what's the psalmist telling us? It is that those who put their trust in the Lord are like the place where they're probably going on a religious pilgrimage. They're in fact like Mount Zion. It is the security that the Lord provides that is not only sturdy and solid like those mountains that, 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 that sort of are all around uh, the city, but it also endures like the mountains, which can only change over the course of millennia. Um, the, uh, the Sidonian limestone, which is what most of that terrain is, um, if, you've, if you've not been there, think of uh, the hill country. Uh, in Mount Austin, it looks very similar in, in, in the hill country there. Uh, it's the same sort of uh, um, chalky substance limestone. Uh, it has an erosion rate of one inch in a thousand years. Okay, it's not going anywhere, right? Um, so um, it has security. So when Psalm 121 says, for instance, uh, "I lift up my eyes, where does my help come from? Uh, my help comes from the Lord, the Maker of heaven and earth." My mother loved this verse. She had it written out on a little piece of paper, and it was uh, up on, on the wall and. Uh, she would make us read Bible verses as we left the house sometimes. Uh, and, you know, as a teenage boy, you're not really interested in that. Um, especially when you have to read, this is the Lord of the all, all joys. And I'm glad of it. Fine. <laughs> I'm leaving now. You know. um, uh, this is a lovely little notion, isn't it? Um, uh, you can tie it back to that whole security question, really, can't you? Um, now, some people just say there is a negative connotation to, to this notion, because at times mountains can be seen as sort of treacherous places, and they are. It's easy to sort of lose your footing, it's easy to stumble, it's easy to fall, uh, and more significantly, the mountains or the hilltops were the places where, um, where uh, oftentimes uh, idols and, were set up and false gods were worshipped. Um, if that's the inference of this verse, then what we need to take from it is the opposite of what we, we, we have probably thought, uh, which is that all oh, the mountains are so nice and that they make me feel good about God. Um, it's rather, uh, if you lift up your eyes to the hills, expect to get help from those idols, <laughs> they're worthless, okay? Where does your help come from? It comes from the Lord, okay, who made heaven and earth. Um, that is, that's one understanding of it. Uh, I'm not going to go with that. Because in both the Hebrew and the Akkadian, uh, the action of lifting the eyes implies looking at something with longing or desire, rather than just looking at something with dread. Um, so I'm going to go with the positive understanding of this. I think my mom would be happier with it. Um, in either case, there's a greater point that has to be made. Which is, again, geography is more than just a little part of the story. 
Sometimes it is the name of a place that is the clue. Oftentimes it's a reference to the rainfall or the topography. And more often than people ever realize, uh, there's frequently a connection between two stories that's not obvious at all uh, and at first until you look at the geography. Uh, and you see that, wait, these events happened in the same place. Uh, where there would have, would have been memory of the first one. Uh, what, we're going to talk about that during our Lenten Sermon series when we look at how, uh, at how Jesus uh, w worked along the same ridge uh, as both Elijah and Jonah do. Uh, Nazareth and, 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 uh, and Yath Hefer, just, 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 just three miles difference there. Um, and there is a connection between those stories in the Old Testament and the story of Jesus in the New Testament. Uh, likewise, um, we can say uh, there, there, is, there, there is significance in the story of the feeding of the, how many thousand? Five thousand. Five thousand? Four thousand. Was it four thousand or five thousand? Ah, it's both. It's, it's two different stories. So, uh, obviously then somebody just got that wrong and, and they missed it up and, and they put the extra story in, but it's the, the, but they've already told the story, okay? Because it's the same story, right? It's not the same story. How do you know that? Because of where it takes place. Okay. Um, and one of the feedings takes place um, on the sort of... Uh, let me see, I'll come over there in a minute too. Uh, one of them takes place here. Uh, that's the feeding of the 5,000. The other takes place down here. Both on the Sea of Galilee, that's the feeding of the 4,000. So the 5,000 is about up here, and the 4,000 is about down here. What's the difference between those areas? One is Gentile and one is not. Yeah, yeah. The, the area on the, on the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee is the Decapolis, Decapolis, uh, ten cities. Uh, these, these are Greek Roman cities. Uh, they've been built to impress people and say to, and say to these uh, backwoodsy Israelites, uh, come over to our side and you're going to get all this wonderful stuff, okay? Uh, and, and, they're, and they're built to sort of look like Roman cities, okay? And they're, and they're populated by Gentiles. On, on, this side, on, the north, uh, on the northwest side of the lake, that is thoroughly Jewish area, okay? Uh, so what's the difference? Well, the stories also tell us 5,000 and 4,000. Well, what's that about? Okay, well... The real distinction is how much is left over. Okay. What's the leftovers here? Uh, and in one case, um, how many baskets are left over? Twelve. And what's how many left over? And the other case? Uh, seven. Okay. Um, okay. Do we just are we just counting poorly here? I mean, it was, should we just say okay, the average was nine and a half? Uh, you know, left over. Uh, no, no. Seven is particularly an important number for the Jews. Uh, or, 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 excuse me, uh, uh, for all the Gentiles. Why? Because that is the number of perfection that, that represents all the nations of the world. Okay. Why, why is 12 an important number for the Jews? The 12 tribes of Israel. Uh, right, which is defining them, okay? And so in, in, each, in each miracle, there's something custom tailor-made to this. And if you don't catch where they're happening, you will sort of miss out on some of that importance. Now, one quick question then. So, uh, why does Jesus do this? I mean, why does he, why does he fool with it? I mean, I mean, if I'd been Jesus, I would have said, you know, I've already done that trick. Uh, mm -hmm. If you missed it, I'm sorry. I, I'd go back, catch... Uh, uh, it's probably on YouTube somewhere. Um, go back and read it, you know. Uh, why does he do it twice? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because he wants to say, look, I didn't just come for the Jews. I came for the Gentiles. I came for everybody, okay? So, yes, uh, I'm here as a Jewish Messiah, but I'm really here as the world's Messiah, okay? Uh, and so whatever I do for the Jews, I'm going to do for the Gentiles. And if you begin to, to sort of look at that particular pattern, what you see is an amazing thing, and that Jesus is consistently replicating what he does for the Jews, for the Gentiles, over and over again, so that everybody gets what he's trying to, I try to actually say. So, uh, geography works on all of this. Now, all this brings us to some of our study, we're talking about how to move from 
the, uh, uh, the words of life to a life well lived. Um, that is, how to develop a strategy to read the Bible more confidently and competently. Now, in this respect, our friends Jack and Marmy, uh, uh, Drs. Beck and Clausen, uh, make a few key assumptions. Um, uh, uh, namely, that because the Bible gives us access to the mind of God, it's going to contain mysteries we will never fully understand. It does, doesn't it? Um, one of my favorite stories is, is, of a, is of a bishop that was visiting at a church and he went to the third grade Sunday school class and, and he asked one of the children, um, what's the Trinity? A little boy, who had kind of a speech thing, said, it's the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, the bishop said, I can't understand you. And the little boy said, you're not supposed to, it's a mystery. <laughs> <laughs> And it's true, isn't it? I mean, there, 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 there are things that, that we just won't get uh, from this. Um, but um, Jesus promised to send us the Holy Spirit to guide us in our study and understanding so we can better comprehend the thoughts of God which have been, have been encoded in His Word. So the goal of Bible study is not just to discover a possible interpretation of a text, but what's the compelling understanding of it? Now, how do we do that? First things first. We begin uh, by praying our way into His Word. Um, John 16, 13 says, When the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all truth. So as you read, you begin by asking the Holy Spirit to quiet your mind and to clarify your thinking so that you can give your full attention to meeting the, uh, the, the, the uh, message of the Lord for you that's been preserved in the Bible. Um, now, remember again what we said earlier that the Bible's written for us, it's not written to us, okay? So what we want to ask God is to show us what He wants us to take from His Word, okay? So, Bible study begins with some prayer, okay? Then second, um, read the text multiple times. Um, uh, maybe use different English, English, English versions, translations, uh, maybe use all those Bibles that you found, in, you know, and, and go through them and say, well, how do they translate this? Uh, write down your initial questions and impressions. Uh, I think that's one of the one of the really keys to the whole thing. Uh, if if you take your Bible uh, and you um, treat it uh, sterile um, and you and and you don't ever feel like it's it's okay to underline something or, or to circle something, um, I think you I think you, you you are missing something. I find this Bible in England and I absolutely love it. Because it, it, it has margins on the side. And so I can write notes in it, I can write questions, I, I can go all the way through it, I can, I can put Hebrew and Greek and, and all, all the things which, which nerdy people like, uh, and I, I can go from there in it. Okay. But you don't have to have that, you just have, have, have to have a piece of paper, or a journal, or something, that as you're reading, you're, you're sort of jotting down impressions, and also questions. Uh, what does this bring to mind? Uh, and you get them all the time, don't you? Uh, I mean, i got to tell you, I've, I've been reading the Bible. I've, I first read the Bible all the way through when I was 13, I think. Um, and I've read the Bible all, all the way through numerous times. Uh, and I've been reading the Bible uh, 54 years, I guess? 50? I don't know, something. Uh, I'm old now, so it's, it, it's, it's been a while. Um, and it's amazing to me how I still find things in there. And I go, well, this wasn't in my original version. Someone has put this in here. Uh, because it wasn't there, or, or I would have seen it. But you don't see things. Um, case in point. Uh, two days ago, uh, listening to Our Daily Bread, if you don't do that, that morning devotion, it's a great one. I, I, I put it on <coughs> as I'm walking. Um, and uh, it, was about the, it was about Jesus being, uh, being tempted. And it said that, uh, that the devil took him up into the high places and said, and he said, throw yourself off, for it is written, God will give his angels guard over you. Uh, and they will catch you. Uh, Jesus says, you're not supposed to tempt, tempt, tempt God. I'm not falling for that, Satan. Um, and then a few verses later, when the devil's finished tempting him, it says that the, the uh, devil left him, and then guess what happens? Yes. Angels come and attend to him. We're going, oh, can't that angels both places here? And so, uh, what is it? It's, it, it's, what, it, it, it's what Jesus is figuring out. You don't use the angels. The, the angels come to you. Uh, 
And you, I, you don't test God, uh, but 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 you do know that in fact those the, those kinds of carrings are 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 uh, for you. Um, so uh, use different translations, and what you're looking for is the big idea, um, which is really um, what is it I'm supposed to be getting here. I say that the, that the most important question to ask in any Bible study, any Bible reading, is the question, so what? But, I mean, what, oh, what does it matter? I mean, why am I reading this? Okay? Uh, and then, what terms or expressions need more study here? And what is it here that disturbs me or confuses me? And is there something here that seems to conflict with other portions of God's Word? If you see those things, you should write them down so that you can, one by one, start to actually deal with them. Um, the next step, then, is, is to troubleshoot whatever problem areas uh, that you find. If you are having difficulty understanding what the text is saying on its own, then consider it first in relationship to the rest of the Bible. Uh, and what book of the Bible is it? Is it in the Old Testament? Is it in the New Testament? Who's the most likely human author of this book? When and where was it written? Uh, to whom is it being written? And what's the overall purpose of this book? Um, if you're having trouble with the meaning of a word, uh, or finding the main point of a sentence, then focus a little on the vocabulary and the grammar. What does the word mean? Uh, there's all kinds of resources you, you can turn to uh, in order to discover them, even if you don't read ancient Greek or Koine uh, 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 Greek or, or ancient Hebrew. Um, and uh, if there's a technical term involved, and there are all kinds of things, sanctification, righteousness, uh, even sin, uh, then look that up in a good in, in a good uh, dictionary of theology. Um, look at how the grammar is at work here. Um, now, sometimes grammar can be too rigorously <laughs> worked on, right? Um, uh, a double negative, for instance, that doesn't always always mean a positive. It's one of my favorite cartoons. I didn't do nothing. English majors, a confession. <laughs> it's, a, it's a double negative, right? Um, uh, you remember diagramming sentences? <laughs> yeah. Okay. I think they stopped doing that. I don't think they do it anymore. It was. It was found that. Uh, did you have to do this? Uh, okay. So you. So 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 you came along uh, uh, after this <coughs> craze of diagramming sentences that that sort of captured all, all the rest of us here. Um, uh, sometimes that can be helpful, but I want to tell you good luck in diagramming anything Paul wrote. Okay? Um, he's a master of the run-on sentences. Uh, and it's made even more difficult by the fact that, that, remember, there's no punctuation in the original Greek text. Okay? So you don't even know, sometimes, where a sentence ends and a new one starts. You're not even completely sure. Sometimes, is this the last letter of the word before or the first letter of the word after it? And, and the Hebrew, in particular, because to save space on the papyrus that is so valuable, they don't, they don't leave any space. They start from right to left, top, and then they go straight across, and they just keep writing, and you've got to figure it out. Okay? Um, um, Titus 1, for instance, begins by saying... Uh, now, I want you to know, this, this is all one sentence in the Greek, okay? Paul, a servant of God and the apostle of Jesus Christ, to further the fault, uh, faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness and the hope of eternal life, which God, who does not lie, promised before the beginning of time, in which now, at this appointed season, he is brought to light through the preaching entrusted to me by the command of God, our Savior, to Titus, my true son, in the common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus, our Savior. That's a little much, isn't it? Okay. Uh, you, you, you want to say that the, the apostle breathe, Paul, breathe. Okay, uh, do stop a little bit here somewhere. But this this is difficulty. So if, if you want a diagram, you're gonna have to break it down in, into some more manageable, smaller sentences. That we, we talked a few sessions ago about identifying uh, what type of writing it is, uh, and we whether it's narrative or poetry or law or wisdom, prophecy, etc. And we, we suggested then, and I think this was two sessions ago, there are some, there are some reading tips, some, some sort of reading rules for all these different genres, for example, for poetry. You read it through several times, you watch for the development of the main thought. Uh, through repetition, through contrast, through expansion, illustration. Okay. Um, you pay some attention to whatever metaphors or figures of speech might be there. 
and you look at the organization. Is there some sort of design behind how the writer is presenting this information? And then, as we've also mentioned, you, you dig into this historical cultural questions. You ask the questions every journalism student learns in news writing, at least I did when, when I was a journalism student, uh, who, what, when, where, why, and, and how. Okay? Um, and likewise, where does this passage belong on that timeline of history that we, uh, we gave you back in the first session, I think? Um, it, it, where is it falling in this, in this progression of God's Word? Uh, and is there somebody famous mentioned in this passage? Is there an event that was noteworthy, like that earthquake uh, in Amos 1? Um, what's the cultural background? Uh, what did it mean for the participants? And again, where are we? Uh, is this particular incident linked to a location? And what does the place tell you about the details of the story? Are you in a wilderness, for instance? Are you in an oasis? Are you on a mountaintop or are you in a valley? Are you at the Dead Sea or are you at the Sea of Galilee? Are you on the Jordan River uh, or are you at the River Jabbok? Are you on the Mediterranean coast uh, or are you so deep back into the hinterlands that folks, uh, uh, I can't even find you there. Um, but having done all that, it is time to bring uh, the text into your life um, by determining just exactly what does it mean for you. Um, so you ask this big content questions. What does this text teach us about God? What, what does it tell us about what God thinks of you? What does it tell you about how God wants you to interact with the world around you? And how does this text speak to the common misunderstandings and popular misconceptions about God? Uh, to get at that, you can uh, consult the interpretation of other people. Um, read some commentaries. Um, if you want some advice as to which ones, just holler at me. Okay? Uh, Multi-volume commentary sets look very nice in a bookcase. Okay? <laughs> they are rarely uniformly good across all, all the books. Uh, one exception might be the New International Version Application Commentary Series. Uh, I, 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 I think it's good across almost all the board. It has a kind of a wonky format. Uh, it breaks everything down into three sections. What's the original meaning? What's the biblical uh, uh, context? And then how do you bridge it? For, for us now, uh, but, and, and sometimes any schema that you put on something kind of forces it sometimes, but it's, it's still good. Um, whether you consult a commentary or not, and I once heard it said that the Bible sheds a lot of light on commentaries, <laughs> um, ultimately what you want to do is ask these personal application questions, um, and then finally consider whether a text is descriptive or prescriptive. Uh, prescriptive means it speaks of a truth or a principle that is to be affirmed uh, as true for all time, all places, all people. Uh, you shall not steal, shall not kill, um, honor your father and your mother, for example. Um, uh, whereas, whereas it's anchored in the unchanging nature of, of, uh, of, of who God is. And then descriptive context includes details that are required to tell a story uh, or divine directives that were designed to meet a temporary need in the story of salvation. This would include things like, uh, like, like cultural practices that are mentioned but not validated. For example, slavery. Um, sometimes people make this argument uh, with, with regard to other social questions. Well, slavery's in the Bible. Have we done over that? Uh, yeah, slavery's in the Bible. It's mentioned in the Bible. It's referred to in the Bible. It's never commended in the Bible. Okay. Uh, there's a big difference for that. Um, 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 practices that were temporarily mandated to, to sort of meet uh, the, the uh, demands of local circumstances. Men shouldn't have long hair. Uh, women shouldn't, shouldn't teach in church. There's some cultural issues going on there for both of those kinds of directives if you begin to sort of, sort of look at it. Are practices that are, me that, that, that are mentioned but not mandated. Um, and, and they're mentioned to, endure, to illustrate some enduring principle. For example, foot washing. Foot washing, John 13, it's a lovely thing, but it's, but it's not mandated for us. It's not a sacrament. It's not something which we have to do. It's meant to illustrate something about, about the nature of a sort of servant. Um, uh, so what are the resources? Um, well, start, start with a good Bible translation. Jack suggests your first Bible should be one that speaks the way you do. Uh, and so take note of the different translation methods. 
um, you, you'll, you'll remember that we talked about uh, the first session whether a translation is functional, which is word for word, uh, or, it's, or it's more dynamic, which is thought for thought, or idea for idea. Um, and that's, 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 that's a significant difference, and there's value in both, uh, in, in both styles, and, and uh, both, uh, both ways of translating. Um, pay a lot of attention to the distinction between paraphrases, um, for example, the message, which is wonderful. Um, Eugene Peterson was a tremendous man of God, he was just, just a saint, and, and what he did in that is, is opened the Bible up to so many people. Uh, in an earlier generation, some of you may have had that green Bible, <laughs> the living Bible, okay? Uh, and that was a paraphrase too. It went really way far in, in, in paraphrasing things, and I thought, no, that's not even close to the actual meaning of it. Uh, but it opened up the Bible to a whole bevy of readers, okay? Uh, so paraphrases have, the, have their, have their uh, purposes on them. Uh, but uh, actual translations have a different feel. Uh, for example, uh, let's, let's take Romans 1.16 uh, in the NIV. I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who further believes, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. And the message, uh, it's, it's news I'm most proud to proclaim. This extraordinary message of God's powerful plan to, to rescue everyone who trusts Him, starting with the Jews, and then right on to everyone else. Uh, okay, it, it, it's saying the same thing, kind of, isn't it? But it has a different feel to it, doesn't it? Uh, so, um, you may want to invest in a good study Bible, uh, which will add um, some basic introduction to the Bible books. Uh, I, I have used a long time this uh, archaeological study Bible. Uh, uh, the first trip to Israel, I, I, I took it with me because it was wonderful. Uh, the second trip to Israel, I left it at home because it's like weighs five tons, okay, and it's on your backpack and you're carrying it around all day long. Uh, and I thought, you know what, I can I can find a, a smaller Bible uh, that will help me out just as well, and then I'll read this back home. Uh, but but this this is great. It has all kinds of things in it. It has it has maps. It has little articles. It, it has uh, uh, book book summaries. Uh, you find something like that, you know, that can kind of speak to, 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 to the texture more of it. Um, uh, then there are all kinds of other resources. Um, Jack and Marmy include in their list of categories um, Bible translations, Bible dictionaries, study Bibles, general reference books, handbooks, uh, books on the literary genre, and I have a handout for you that will give you all of this. Uh, historical background, cultural background, single volume commentaries. Um, uh, a good Bible atlas is appropriate. Um, this is one I've sort of been using. And it, it, it's, it's Jack Beck's Bible atlas, and it's, it's wonderful. But I tell you, there's a new one coming out that, he, that he's just done. It's just come out in the last two weeks, I think. Uh, I got to pre-read it uh, and write a, write a little comment for it. Uh, it's the basic Bible atlas. And if you, if you uh, do it on on uh, Amazon, it's there, uh, the Basic Bible Atlas by John A. Beck, uh, and it is incredible. It, it's, it's, just, it's, it's just a wonderful resource uh, for that. Um, so, um, lots of resources then, um, and let me give you, in fact, um, a list of these. Um, so, uh, oh, uh, this funny. I mean, I'm going to cause a marital discord or <laughs> Sometimes people say that they share it, they don't know. <laughs> so this is something Jack and Marmy have developed. Uh, so I just want to share it, share it with you. Uh -huh. Some of these, some of these books that are that are, that are listed here uh, are, are are very good, uh, and uh, but you don't have to get them all. Certainly, I'm not telling you to go out and build a theological library. Uh, it's just it's just a thought from that. Um, uh, I'll give you as well um, Jack's suggestion for how to go from uh, the words of life to life well lived, and in his words. Uh, that's kind of what we've just been talking about just a little bit there. 
You will notice that the, the experienced tester um, uh, goes, goes to the other way first and the second time so that nobody feels like he's showing favorites. Uh, okay. So, um, let's stop and see if there are there any, any questions. Is this a helpful kind of kind of uh, summation for you on, on, on this? Uh, and again, if we miss something, you want to go back. Uh, it is on the website, and in particular, um, I think some of what we talked about two sessions ago with regard to um, some of the context and getting it back is is an important part. Uh, and then the more basic question in the first session about how's the Bible organized uh, might, might might be helpful to you. Uh, so, any any other questions you might have? Yeah. Uh, first, I want to thank you for the the last five weeks. It's been very very helpful to me yeah. and enlightening. I have a question about other religious texts in comparison uh -huh. with the Bible. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that, and what makes the Bible unique? Okay. Uh, I'm happy to answer that. Um, uh, let me take uh, the Book of Mormon, for example. Um, uh, and the Quran, both, okay, uh, both of which are which are historical texts, uh, which are the basis of different different uh, different belief systems. Um, uh, this in no way is reflective on Mormons as a people or on Muslims as a people. Uh, it is reflective on their holy book, um, uh, the Book of Mormon, for example. If you know its history, um, Joseph Smith. Uh, uh, was kind of uh, drifting around uh, and in Palmyra, New York, upstate New York, he found a cave, he went into the cave and he found in that cave some tablets that had ancient writing on them uh, that was a mixture of hieroglyphics and Greek and Hebrew and all kinds of things. Uh, he found these tablets in the, in the cave. Uh, he couldn't read them, obviously, because he didn't know these things, uh, but he also fortunately found some golden spectacles that he could put on, and when he put the spectacles on, then he, he could read it, he could translate it. So he stood behind a curtain and he, and he read it aloud, and people, people uh, actually wrote that down. And this, in the Book of Mormon, tells of this pre-Columbian culture in the Americas uh, in which Jesus Christ comes. That's why he's Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints. I just got to tell you that there's no archaeological evidence whatsoever for a pre uh, pre-Columbus culture that he, that he describes in, in, in North America. Um, the story of the way in which these tablets come to pass and no one ever sees them except him uh, is one that I would find difficult to sort of swallow. Uh, and then what the Book of Mormon tells you about in particular doesn't even always make, make sense. Um, the Quran, likewise, um, is primarily produced by Muhammad, by the Prophet Muhammad. Um, it is. It varies from the beginning of the Quran to the end of the Quran because the Quran is a progressive revelation in which there are um, different settings for both, uh, which is why you can sometimes have things in the Quran which would contradict itself. Uh, one that would say it's a religion of peace, and one which would say basically kill the infidels. Okay. Uh, it depends upon where Muhammad was in the progression of history at that time. Was Islam in ascendancy or was it still uh, a kind of a small persecuted cult? Okay. Um, one of the things I would say is that um, there's very little archaeological evidence um, for other religious books. Um, there's tons of it for the Bible, tons of it. And uh, to my knowledge, there's never been an archaeological finding which has, which has disputed anything <coughs> significant about the Bible. Uh, in fact, what the archaeology continues to find actually will corroborate what the Bible says over and over again. Uh, so I think uh, historically and uh, archaeologically, 
Uh, and even even sort of theologically, we can we can look at these texts and can say, okay, uh, which one seems like it has um, more credence to it than the others do? And that, that's where the Bible comes in. Again, it does not mean that, that those who follow uh, Quran are not good people. It does not mean, it, it, but I, I do believe it is, it is, it is, um, uh, I say this very hesitantly, uh, um, it, it's not the truth. Okay, it's, it, it's not the truth, at least as we find it. Uh, other books, um, as, uh, uh, sacred books, the the uh, the uh, Bhagavad Gita, uh, and some of the some of the writings of the Hindus and, and the Buddhists, which speak to, uh, for example, uh, reincarnation. Um, well, the Bible says the exact opposite. It's not reincarnation for us. It's actually resurrection. You think about it. You can't have both, can you? I mean, you're either reincarnated, you just keep going through, or you are resurrected. You know? uh, and so you kind of have to look at these and say which one of these. Uh, seems to sort of speak more seriously uh, to the notion of some absolute truth in them. So I don't know if that's helpful, but, okay. but that's that, that's where I would go with that. Uh, it's it's a whole lot more complicated than that, uh, but yeah. Well, we're going to stop here, and we're going to close with, with, with some words of John Wesley. Um, he once wrote this. He said, "I want to know one thing: the way to heaven, how to land safe on that happy shore. God Himself has condescended to teach the way." For this end he came from heaven, he has written it down in a book. Give me that book. At any price, give me the book of God. Um, and I think that's, that, that's, that's where we kind of end up with the scripture. Um, uh, what I've found is that in the scripture, uh, I really am hearing God's voice. Uh, and, I, and I really am sensing his, his sort of leading. Uh, it's not like you throw the throw a Bible against the wall, and whatever verse it opens up to, that's what God's saying to you. Um, uh, that's 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 not a responsible way to sort of deal with it. Uh, but it is to say that even sometimes in the most pedantic ways imaginable, God will speak to you through something in the Bible that just says, "Yeah, that's right." Uh, uh, one very quick story: uh, when I was a missionary a lot long ago, I was in the train station in Budapest. I was waiting to meet some people there that I was going to, to be doing some work uh, with behind the Iron Curtain at the time. Uh, I had said, I'll meet you uh, at, by the front door of the train station in Budapest. I hadn't been to Budapest. I did not realize there were 13 front doors <laughs> in the train station in, in Budapest. <laughs> and I thought, okay, let me just find one and sit there. You know, um, I had been meeting through the book of Hebrews. I just happened to be, that's, the, that's where I was at that time. Um, and I came upon this little passage, and it said, uh, it's in Hebrews, Hebrews 10, uh, uh, but you have need of patience, uh, uh, and yet a, little, yet a short while, he who is to come will come. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I closed it up, I looked up, and there was the guy, you know. Uh, and uh, I thought, okay, now God didn't put that in there for me, uh, but God put me in that place in the Bible uh, so that I could have a word of encouragement from him. And that, that, that's what I find in this book over and over again. Um, i got to go teach confirmation now, which is, uh, y'all are much more better behaved than the 25 seventh graders that are over in the other hall waiting. Uh, so um, let's just pray together. Uh, so Lord, bless this time we've had. Uh, give us a, a hunger for your word thirst to hear your voice, um, and then as we look to you, show us um, all, we need to, all we need to ever know. We ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you guys for, for being a part of this. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Thank you.